Today, let's continue discussing the sixth season of Bloody Gangsters. Due to their daughter's severe illness, Toss and Lizzie hurriedly took her to the hospital. The doctor diagnosed Ruby with tuberculosis and recommended isolating her for treatment. At this time, Thomas's mental state was completely chaotic. He disregards the doctor's objections and insists on staying by his daughter's side. Fortunately, Lizzie constantly reassures him and helps calm his emotions. After apologizing to the hospital staff, the couple undergoes tests and is found not to be infected. Following the doctor's diagnosis, it is confirmed that Ruby indeed has tuberculosis, and her condition is worsening. During this era, there are no particularly effective treatments for tuberculosis. The doctor presents Lizzie with two op inducing lung, collapse for rest, or using gold salts for treatment. However, the first option has a low success rate, while the second option is too risky. Thomas has no faith in the doctor's ability to cure his daughter's illness. He constantly apologizes to Ruby while staying by her side. Thomas believes that the curse he brought caused his daughter to become seriously ill. To lift the curse, Thomas decides to personally seek out Esme. Esme had mentioned cursing the Shelby family before leaving, and perhaps his daughter's illness is a result of her actions. Back at home, Thomas makes a call to Ada. Although Ada doesn't want to be involved in any Razor Party matters anymore, she is currently the most reliable person in the Shelby family. In the next five days, Ada needs to meet with Musley and Jack in London. She also needs to handle internal company matters. Although Ada is reluctant, she does not refuse her brother. Soon, Ada arrives at Diana's residence. Upon seeing that Thomas himself did not come, Diana feels somewhat disappointed. Before Ada enters the house, Diana asks the butler to identify the brand of Ada's clothes. Then she brings out an antique face and places it on the table. Shortly after, Ada enters the room, and Diana pretends to warmly welcome her. Before they chatted for a few words, she started to show off her noble status, trying to overwhelm Ada in terms of momentum. However, Ada came prepared. She had already investigated everyone involved in this meeting. Due to her interest in collecting antiques, Ada quickly identifies the vase on the table as an ancient Egyptian artifact, surprising Diana. Then Diana was slightly disparaging, emphasizing Ada's gypsy identity and gang background. She subsequently asks Ada why Thomas didn't come, and Ada truthfully explains the reason. Diana brought out the vase to mock Thomas. She believes that Thomas is like the horseback rider depicted on the vase, only willing to ride slowly, not even willing to gallop a few steps. But Ada points out that the black knight on the vase symbolizes impending death, which indeed represents Thomas. I read only pornography and politics. Her words made Ada laugh, because Diana's words were very direct. Diana promised again that she would advocate for the fascist organization not to clear gypsies. Although Ada calmly responded to the other party throughout, she was already quite disgusted in her heart. Soon Mosley walked into the room. Smelling the cheap perfume on him, Diana sarcastically commented that he had gone out to fool around with other women again. Mosley didn't say much in embarrassment. Then, Mosley expressed dissatisfaction with Thomas's absence, and Diana took the opportunity to mock Ada. Unable to bear it any longer, Ada stated that she is the representative of Shelby Company. In addition to introducing Jack to the two of them, she is also preparing to extend an invitation to everyone. Mosley asked what Ada's invitation was, but Ada did not directly tell him. She told Mosley to remember that in this moment, the ones in power in this room are the Shelby family. So when she speaks, she asks them all to be quiet and not interrupt. As soon as she finished speaking, Jack and Gina happily walked into the room, and their relationship looked very close. Because Jack thinks highly of himself, he is very arrogant when talking to others. He started by quoting Gina's words, calling the Shelby family wizards who can talk to dead people, and said that Diana is the spokesperson for banned drugs and jewelry. But after chatting with Ada for a few sentences, Jack realized that Thomas's sister is extraordinary. So he became interested in her. After sitting down, everyone tried to gain the upper hand in the conversation. Hearing that Thomas was absent from the meeting because his daughter was sick, Jack was quite dissatisfied. At a counter that Jack's family also died of tuberculosis. Thomas doesn't believe in the current medical level, so he is preparing to use gypsy methods to save his daughter. Jack should be able to understand this approach. Upon hearing this, Jack expressed agreement. 
and he also became interested in Thomas. Driven by competitiveness, both Ada and Diana were boasting about the influence of their men. As a result, Jack sarcastically ridiculed both of them. Seeing that everyone was almost done talking, Ada sent invitations to everyone. She said that today was just a meeting, and everyone can go to Thomas's home to discuss business later, and the Irish will also join. After discussing the business matters, Ada questioned Diana why no one poured her a drink. On the other side, Thomas followed the Gypsy symbols and found Esme's camp. Seeing that the camp residents insisted that Esme was not here, Thomas took out his gun and money. He said that he has an urgent matter to find Esme now. Those who obey will get money, and those who don't will face the gun. Soon, Esme voluntarily came to Thomas and took the money. Although she didn't admit it, Thomas immediately saw that all these gypsies were under Esme's command. In fact, Esme deliberately left clues for Thomas because she wanted to know why he contacted her. Thomas explained that his daughter is sick, possibly because of a curse, and he wants to know if Esme is the one who cursed her. After listening to Thomas's words, Esme remembered the past. She said that Polly could also break the curse, but Thomas told her that Polly had already passed away. However, seeing Esme's expression, Thomas felt that this matter had nothing to do with her, so he prepared to leave. After getting on the car, Thomas found that it couldn't start because the spark plug had been pulled out by someone, and the person who did this was Esme. Esme first sarcastically remarked that Thomas was not as alert as before, and then said that she was willing to help. Ruby's curse was not caused by Esme, but Esme knew the reason behind it. Under Esme's guidance, Thomas drove and rode a horse, and they finally arrived at a cemetery. Along the way, Thomas confessed that it was his past sins that led to the punishment. In order to lift the curse, he was willing to sacrifice everything. They came to the grave of a little girl, and Esme mentioned an old event from 10 years ago. They had a blue sapphire that had been cursed by gypsies, and Grace was killed after wearing it. Later, Thomas gave the blue sapphire to Bethany Barwell. Although Thomas made it clear that the blue sapphire was cursed, Bethany still took it back and gave it to her sister Evadne. Evadne had the blue sapphire on her daughter, and as a result, the little girl died that night due to illness. Esme believed that the girl's mother cursed Thomas. In gypsy culture, only women can cast curses. As soon as he heard this, Thomas became furious. In order to save his daughter, he was willing to give a lot of money to the woman to lift the curse. But gypsies are always elusive, so Thomas could only ask Esme to help him find her. Esme took the opportunity to ask for a high price. Due to the economic crisis, paper money was worthless, so Esme asked Thomas to pay her with gold. Thomas immediately agreed. On the other side, Ada came to Thomas's office and the staff kept reminding her of the various rules set by Thomas. But Ada responded impatiently, saying that she had the final say in the next five days. From Ada's state, it can be seen that she was annoyed because of dealing with the Razor Party's affairs. But at the moment, Thomas urgently needed help and no one except his sister could help him. Opening the drawer, Ada saw a to-do item with the address of the Razor Party's warehouse in Liverpool. Seeing the Black Star logo, Ada understood that this operation would involve killing someone. Shortly after, Ada found Isaiah, a young man who used to be Finn's partner. He is currently helping the Razor Party run the horse racing business, and Ada wants to know where Arthur is. Isaiah explained that he was locked up because he was under the influence of contraband. Despite Ada's claim to be the acting boss, Isaiah's attitude remained very casual. He even asked what brand of perfume Ada was wearing as he would buy it for his girlfriend. Ada asks Isaiah to go to Liverpool, where the Razor Party stores their banned items. But recently, there are always dock workers stealing goods, and the more they steal, the bolder they become. They must be taught a lesson. Isaiah's mission this time is to punish the ringleader, Hayden. Originally, this task was marked with the Black Star logo, but Ada decided to withdraw it after considering it. She said that beating him up would be enough. After hearing this, Isaiah began to question Ada's authority to do so. Ada became very angry. Ada orders Isaiah to take Arthur with her. Although Arthur is not in good condition now, his reputation still carries a lot of weight, and ordinary people dare not provoke him. If the mission is successfully completed, Ada guarantees that Isaiah's secret bet on the horse race, which has already been fixed, will not be disclosed to Thomas. Ada then went to the tavern and met Lizzie. Currently, Ruby's condition is very bad, 
and Lizzie is almost on the verge of collapse. She didn't understand why Thomas went up the mountain to find the gypsies instead of staying with his daughter. And now, Thomas is either crazily blaming himself or venting his anger on others. His state is not normal. Ada doesn't know what to say about this. She can only do her best to comfort Lizzie, but obviously it doesn't help much. Meanwhile, Isaiah brought Arthur in before they set off. He asked Arthur for permission to bring along a few relatives who also want to make a name for themselves. Arthur fixed his hair first, then told Isaiah that they didn't need anyone else's approval if they wanted to achieve something. Soon, everyone arrived at the dock in Liverpool. Before preparing for action, Arthur lectured his men. They were dressed in Razor Party attire and had to be as fierce and brutal as the Razor Party. And after completing the task, their appearance must be kept clean and elegant, as this is the style of the Razor Party. Soon, they arrived at the warehouse and demanded Hayden to show up. Seeing that the workers were deliberately covering for Hayden, Aisha used rough methods to intimidate them. Upon hearing that someone was looking for him, Hayden, who had just finished playing football, returned to the warehouse. Seeing that the Razor Party people were armed, Hayden realized the seriousness of the situation. Arthur told Hayden that he should have been killed because he stole the Razor Party's goods and sold them, but today they decided to spare his life. As long as he took a beating, the matter would be resolved, and he shouldn't do the same thing again in the future. However, before Arthur could take action, Hayden tried to persuade Arthur with words. He knew that Arthur was being tortured by prohibited items and was in agony, and he couldn't get rid of it despite trying every means. Hayden had a similar experience, so he understood Arthur very well. But now, Hayden has overcome himself, and if Arthur is willing to follow his example, he can definitely get rid of his bad habits. The only one who can help Arthur is himself. After hearing Hayden's words, Arthur realized that he seemed to understand himself better than anyone else. Arthur has been troubled by prohibited items and failed marriages for many years, and Hayden not only accurately pokes at these pains, but even brings hope to Arthur. Seeing that Arthur was wavering, Isaiah was eager to take action. After hesitating for a moment, Arthur finally decided to spare Hayden. When he left, his mood seemed much relieved. At night, Thomas returned to the hospital, and Lizzie was desperately waiting for him at the door. Seeing his devastated wife, Thomas finally realized that their daughter Ruby had passed away. Before her death, Ruby wanted to see her father one last time, and all Lizzie could do was kiss her on behalf of Thomas. Upon hearing this news, Thomas completely broke down. He let the rain beat down on him, his pupils engulfing the world in front of him like an abyss. After Ruby's death, Thomas held a funeral for her in the gypsy way. Overwhelmed with grief, Thomas asked Arthur to recite the eulogy for him, but Arthur was also very sad and in pain at the time so he refused his brother. After gathering himself, Thomas walked heavily towards the crowd. He said that this riverside was the place where his daughter loved the most during her lifetime. To commemorate Ruby, Thomas vowed that from now on, only kindness, honesty, peace, and beauty would flow in this river. When reading the eulogy, Thomas was so choked up that he could no longer continue. Uncle Charlie saw this and brought gasoline to Thomas's side, suggesting that they could officially cremate Ruby. That's how Thomas prepared to bid farewell to his daughter with a big fire. Seeing this scene, Lizzie suddenly lost control of her emotions. She still couldn't accept her daughter's death, let alone see her being cremated. First, Thomas comforted his wife, and then they both walked into the carriage to see their daughter one last time. In front of Ruby's coffin, Thomas quietly told Lizzie, while holding her arm, that he would make the person who killed Ruby pay. Upon hearing these words, Lizzie was puzzled and didn't understand who Thomas was planning to seek revenge on. Faced with his wife's confusion, Thomas didn't explain. He just walked out of the carriage and hugged his son Charles. As the carriage was set on fire, Thomas left the funeral despite his wife's dissuasion. With Esme's help, Thomas quickly found Evadne Baver. He believed that it was this woman's curse that killed Ruby. Since she doesn't know Thomas, Evadne is ready to negotiate with him. However, without saying anything, Thomas shot and killed her. Three men in the camp tried to resist, but they were also killed. After the carnage, Thomas walked towards his car. Revenge did not bring him relief. It only intensified the pain in his heart. Throwing away the magazine, smashing the gun, no matter how he vented his anger, he could no longer bring his daughter back to this world. In the revenge, tainted with blood and tears, Thomas only added the guilt of four more lives to himself, 
And then, according to the agreement, Thomas gave the gold powder to Esme. Due to the fact that things have already been handled, Thomas no longer wants any connection with her. However, Esme tells him that the gods took away his daughter, but will still give him a son. It turns out that Thomas has another illegitimate child. Before joining World War I, Thomas had a passionate affair with a woman named Zelda. As a result, they had a child named Duke who is now in front of Thomas. This scene leaves Thomas a bit confused. Now there are many things waiting for him to handle, so he doesn't have time to acknowledge another son. However, Esme insists that Thomas consider it. Now that Duke's mother is dead, he has been living through petty theft. If Thomas is willing to give Duke a chance, his fate can definitely be changed. And he is Thomas's own son. Of course, if Thomas wants Esme to arrange for them to recognize each other as father and son, he will have to give her money. At night, Thomas returns home, and Lizzie is very angry because she has learned about what Thomas did during the day. When communicating with Lizzie, Thomas tried to change the topic. For example, he is helping Churchill fight against Musley, or the Shelby family is preparing to set up a foundation to treat tuberculosis. She cannot accept that her husband has killed again, and in their daughter's name. As the argument becomes more intense, they both start shouting at each other. Seeing that she can't persuade her husband, Lizzie prepares to go to her room. Before leaving, she mentions two things. One is that the doctor has an urgent matter to contact Thomas, and the other is that Arthur has arrived. Soon, Thomas finds Arthur in the wine cellar. After the funeral, Arthur had not recovered from the grief. He puts his cup next to the barrel and watches the drops of wine fall into it. In his eyes, these barrels contained not wine, but blood or prohibited items. Seeing that his older brother is still not very clear-headed, Thomas tells a story from the past. When Thomas and Arthur were young, they had a fight, and in the end, Thomas won. He feels that it was after this incident that Arthur began to become increasingly unclear. Maybe it was because Thomas hit him on the head too many times. Arthur, of course, does not admit this and insists that they were evenly matched. But this doesn't change Thomas's statement, and then Thomas prepares to have a drink. This is the first time he has touched alcohol in four years, and with a cigarette and alcohol, Thomas recalls another past event. At that time, the Shelby family was suddenly attacked by the police on a boat. Everyone was scared and jumped into the water, but only Arthur dared to confront the police head. On. From that moment on, Thomas realized that Arthur deliberately lost to him when they were young, and he has always been accommodating to him since then. In fact, Thomas said all this to cheer Arthur up again. In such a difficult moment, Arthur is the key person to help the family get through it. After hearing his brother's words, Arthur is deeply moved, and the two of them tightly hold each other's hands. Shortly after, Mosley and Jack, along with others, come to Thomas's house, and they negotiate about cooperation. Before going downstairs, Thomas sees his son Charles sitting on the stairs. Because Ruby's face always appears in his mind, Charles can't sleep. Seeing his son's condition, Thomas tells him to go and stay with his mother. If someone touches you, you won't shut her. And Charles obeys. While waiting, Jack suggests that Laura sing a song by the Irish Republican Army. Laura is somewhat reluctant because she doesn't want to sing such a song when Thomas is sad. And Mosley is also quite displeased with this. Diana talks about her experience in Berlin. At that time, she and high-ranking German fascists were envisioning the future together and publicly torturing Jews during meals. Hearing Diana casually recount her experience of abusing Jews, the atmosphere at the table became even more awkward. Seeing the ugly expressions of the two in front of him, Mosley proudly thought Diana did a great job. He no longer minded letting Laura sing, and Laura had no choice but to start singing. Diana kept staring at Thomas hiding in the shadows, while Thomas looked forward emotionlessly. The grief of losing his daughter still tore at his soul. At the same time, Arthur ran to Chinatown and snatched a bunch of prohibited items. His pace was awkward and desperate. Lizzie came to the stable alone and cried bitterly. It seemed that only the white horse beside her was willing to listen to her heart. On the other side, fascist members smashed Ada's glass. The reason was that Ada had a daughter with Ben. Ben was black, and the fascist members not only hated Jews, but also hated black people. In anger, Ada took out a gun and drove everyone away. Back at home, her son Carl told her, 
that because of her sister's skin color, he was also being alienated by his classmates at school. Racist ideology is spreading rapidly among young people in Britain. Seeing that Carl disliked her sister, Ada confessed that Carl's father was actually Jewish. In order to prevent being bullied by others, their family changed their surname to Son. If your sister were sent to Africa, where do you think you would be sent? At this time, Thomas and the guests officially began negotiations. As an investigator sent by the American president, Jack can provide feedback on the situation in Europe according to his own will. Mosley and Diana immediately promised that they could represent the British people and fascism would definitely become mainstream in Britain. Next, Laura expressed that the Irish are willing to follow Britain while maintaining their national independence, but they also need support from the United States. Jack expressed his concerns about the thriving workers' movements in both countries. The representatives from both sides promised to stop these activities. However, due to Thomas's membership in the Labour Party, Jack is very concerned about his attitude. Mosley then responded on behalf of Thomas, stating that Thomas has a very high level of support in the House of Commons. When the time is right, Thomas will resign from his party position and then rerun as an independent. At that time, he will become the core force of the fascist organization. However, Jack still does not trust Thomas and wants him to speak out his true attitude towards fascism. After a brief silence, Thomas lied and said that he would definitely support their cause. But Mosley believed that it was not enough and demanded that Thomas must utter the slogan of destroying the Jews. Although Thomas was very reluctant, he did so. In the end, Jack was willing to give feedback to the President of the United States according to Mosley's suggestion and promised to provide weapons for the Irish Republican Army. Seeing that Thomas genuinely supported them, Jack was also willing to cooperate with the Shelby Company. Seeing that his plan was successful, Thomas was very satisfied, but in his contemplation, he caught a glimpse of the small chair that his daughter Ruby had sat on, and memories rushed into his mind. Overwhelmed by grief, Thomas left the room without saying a word. The others then scattered as well. After venting their emotions by shooting in the yard, Thomas will print the contents of the meeting and prepare to hand them over to Churchill, and he will not get any sleep all night. The next morning, Lizzie came to Thomas with a letter from the hospital. Seeing that he burned Ruby's chair, Lizzie couldn't help but burst into tears. Ruby's death was a heavy blow to them. Nevertheless, Thomas still wanted to do everything he could to defeat Musley. His work was far from over. Shortly afterwards, Thomas received a phone call in his office. According to his subordinate's report, Mosley was with Gina. Soon, Thomas drove to the apartment where the two were located and saw Mosley walking out. After Mosley left, Thomas went upstairs and knocked on Gina's door. Gina realized that something was wrong, but it was too late. Thomas told Gina that her affair with Mosley would definitely anger Jack, not to mention Michael. After being threatened for a while, Gina couldn't bear it and asked Thomas what his real purpose was. Thomas replied that Gina would follow Mosley to Berlin, and then she must provide important information about the German side to Thomas. Gina didn't have to think about lying because Thomas could tell whether she was telling the truth or not. Before leaving, Thomas wanted to test it first, so he asked Gina about Michael's true attitude towards him. Gina earnestly told him that Michael wanted to complete this deal, and then both he and Thomas could escape. Hearing this, Thomas smirked disdainfully and then turned and left. Back at home, Thomas noticed a letter from the hospital. This letter was written by Thomas's personal doctor, who needed to meet Thomas in person. The next day, Thomas met with the doctor, who immediately said that 10 days ago, Thomas had undergone an examination. After diagnosis, it was found that he did not have tuberculosis, but the doctors discovered a tumorcle growing inside his skull. This disease was most likely transmitted by Ruby. The doctor had been wanting to inform Thomas about this, but he couldn't reach him in any way. The various physical and mental conditions that Thomas had recently experienced were caused by this reason. However, his illness would no longer be contagious to others. Perhaps, Thomas had defeated countless strong enemies before, but now he had to surrender in the face of the disease. Due to the high risk, no doctor dared to perform surgery on Thomas. In less than a year and a half, Thomas will become completely ill. In the end, he would have to continue his life under the care of his family. After the meeting, Thomas hid the truth from Lizzie. But considering his physical condition, Thomas understood that he had to make the most of his time. With Thomas's efforts, Musley, Laura, 
and Jack finally reached a cooperation, and his secret plan to fight against the fascist forces has also made significant progress. However, after learning about his own condition, how will Thomas plan his next actions, and where will his and the Shelley family's fate go? Please subscribe to my channel. Share different movies and videos every day.